here back when I was a child. One day I'm going to be famous and everybody's going to remember. And nobody does. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I got some good news I want to share with you guys today. It might be some of the best news that you've heard all week. Uh, if you're visiting with us, this might be some of the greatest news you've ever heard in your entire life. For God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who's going to believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to condemn the world. You want to know why he sent him? He sent his son to save the world. Can we give God some praise for that? I think that's a real good I uh, heard a story this week about a woman who was 34 years old who had an idea that she thought she was going uh, to die very soon. And she's had this gut feeling that she was not going to live very long. She could feel death knocking on the door. So she went to all the doctors she could. She took all of the medicine that she could find. She became very sick and frail and was told that she couldn't have a child because her body was not strong enough to handle it. Her husband had to come to terms that his wife was literally killing herself until one day she was given a Bible and she started to read the Bible. And one day as yes, she was walking with her husband, it was uh, uh, literally early spring. The snow still sprinkled on the ground. She noticed some flowers that were trying to break through the ground and through the snow. And she thought, how beautiful is that? Even in the midst of all the chaos in the world and all the snow and the hard ground and all the hard soil, there's some, there's some flowers that are breaking through and starting to bloom. She then noticed the leaves on the tree that were growing out of the branches. And she looked up and she saw the beautiful blue sky. And then all of a sudden she screams, I see it! I see it! And her husband says, what do you see? She says, I see life. I see life in the flowers. I see life in the trees. I see life everywhere. And if I see it everywhere, she said, it also must be within me. Because if God cares about the flowers on the ground and the leaves on the tree and the birds in the air, he must care about me. She ended up dying one night when she turned 96 years old. Amen. I am tired of walking around and thinking the world is in it. And I'm tired of walking around being told that this is the most important election of our lifetime. You know, well, so was the hundred elections before us. You know what I'm saying? Every election is the most important election of our lifetime. I'm tired of the doom and gloom. I'm tired of the get ready and buckle up because life is about to crash. I serve a risen Savior. I serve a God who is bringing revival to college campuses across this nation. I watched a group of students this Wednesday morning before the crack of dawn from Pendleton County who woke up early, got around a flagpole, started praying while their peers were getting off the school bus, walking right by. That's the kind of thing we're living in right now. I woke up this morning and wanted to share some good news with you. So if you have your Bibles, turn me to 1 Peter chapter 4, 14 through 19. All right? 1 Peter chapter 4, 14 through 19. As you turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, I always say this. It's one thing to take advice from somebody about a certain topic. It's another thing to take advice from someone who has actually lived through the thing that they're giving you. Right? Uh, it's a different world. I, uh, uh, me and Angie went to this conference on Tuesday. The main speaker was a guy named Dr. Orge. And I thought he was just going to lecture us. He, he was, uh, looked kind of nerdy. He was the president of a seminary. And so I was like, oh, this is going to be a boring day listening to this guy lecture us about seminary things. Uh, but then he started talking. He started talking about how he was a chaplain for 10 years for the San Francisco Giants. He shared all the struggles and the hurt and victories that he went through in his 20 years as the president of the seminary. He was sharing things about uh, his life experiences that he had, and I was just hanging on every single word because he's been through things that I could relate to. And because he went through those things, there was a certain sense of respect that I had no choice but to give him because he went through those things. The same, the same way I feel about Dr. Orch this week is the same way I feel about Peter. Peter had so much life experience. Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't someone of great stature or academics. He was one of the disciples of Jesus, one of Jesus' closest friends. A lot of people don't know this, but Peter was married. Peter was married. And it's so funny to me because the Catholic Church considered Peter the first pope. Well, the first pope was married, okay? Y'all can look that up. Jesus went and visited the mother-in-law and everything. So y'all can, can look that up and you get some chance this week. But as important as Peter was to the early church and to Christ, he made a lot of mistakes. He went through a lot of incredible sufferings. And yet, through his mistakes, God was still able to use Peter in a mighty way. It was Peter who tried to walk on water but got nervous and started to drown. 
It was Peter, along with others, who fell asleep when they were supposed to be praying and standing guard while Jesus prayed in the garden. It was Peter who cut off the ear of the soldier who came to get Jesus. It was Peter that denied that Jesus even existed, not once, not twice, but three different times. Now, naturally, because we know these events, most of us have heard them our entire life growing up in church, and so we don't even think anything of it. But if somebody did that inside this church, you know, if, 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 if literally, if Andrew showed a lack of faith, uh, and if Andrew cut off somebody's ear inside the church, you know what I'm saying? We wouldn't be too pumped about uh, having Andrew as our social pastor, you know what I'm saying? If Andrew went and told three different people inside this church that he didn't believe in the existence of Jesus, he would not only be disqualified from the ministry of this church, but he would also be disqualified from all ministry. We would kick him out and we'd say, well, how, how are you going to sit there and deny the existence of Jesus, but also claim to be an associate pastor at Trans Baptist Church. You get what I'm saying? These are some pretty big issues that he had. And, and so as I think about Peter, through the love and ministry of Christ, we see how a loving and gracious Savior treated Peter. When Peter started to sink into the sea, it was Jesus that went there to pick him up out of that sea and save him. When Peter cut off the ear of the soldier, it was Jesus who healed the ear and told him to put down the sword. And even though Peter denied knowing him uh, three different times, after Jesus died and was resurrected, he went and met with the disciples for a, for a breakfast time. Jesus asked Peter, not once, not twice, but three times, do you love me? Giving Peter an opportunity to really repent of his sins. Peter would go on and preach the day of Pentecost with 3,000 people were added to his numbers. He would go on and heal and plant churches. He would later be corrected by Paul on the way he treated the Gentiles. And ultimately, Peter would die for his faith. If there was anyone who could talk to us about finding joy in the midst of struggle, right? Happiness in the midst of, of chaos, right? To, to understand and know the good news and what the good news of Jesus Christ can do to people, it would be Peter. If, if, if there was anybody who could tell us about Jesus Christ from a personal perspective, it was Peter. Peter was the one who said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than, than to God, make your own judgment, for we cannot stop speaking about the things we have seen and heard. He was there. This is important. And so that's who we're going to be hearing from today. That's who's going to be telling us what it means to have true joy. So let's all stand for the reading of God's holy word, 1 Peter chapter 4, 14 through 19. Peter what he says, if you are insulted for the name of Jesus Christ, you are blessed. We'll say that again, because some of y'all get upset when people mock you. Here he goes. Here's what Peter said. If you're insulted for the name of Jesus Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. A troublesome meddler. That's my rewind button. A troublesome meddler. But if any, anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this, in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. May God bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. You may be seated. The good news of Jesus Christ should bring us joy. The good news of Jesus Christ should bring us peace. The good news of Jesus Christ should bring us hope. Don't waste what Christ has given us as born again believers because we're so worried about using the negative things in our life as a crutch instead of using it as a tool. Normally, like a good Baptist pastor, I usually have three different points that I talk about and walk through as we go through a piece of scripture. But can I be honest with you today? I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been literally taking a class in school telling me how to preach for the last two months. And, it, and it's made me more and more angry as, as I keep sitting through these things because they're making it, uh, um, they're making it so formula, okay, that I feel like they're removing God from the process. And, and, and it's, listen, I... To, there's an extent where I understand that the young men that are in the class need to know the, the how to structure a sermon in order to be effective. I get all that stuff, but I'm really I'm just exhausted listening to these people telling me how I'm supposed to write a sermon and deliver a sermon and all these kind of things. So I'm so tired of that that I, this week I just feel like doing the opposite of everything that professor and every other pastor has been saying because 
on Tuesday during the Revival House Conference, uh, pastors, we, I was part of the panel discussion because I was on the breakout, I did a breakout with one of the speakers, there's three of us, and so I was part of the panel discussion where all these pastors were able to ask us questions. And they were asking us these questions, great questions, those characteristics of, of a revivalization pastor, all these kind of things. And these, all these other guys were giving these very structured, biblical answers. Well, in James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, block. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I didn't know all that. You know, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a scripture for everything I've done in my life, but I know what God has done. You know, I know what God has done. I don't have a scripture to sit there and quote off the top of my head to tell you. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just sitting there going, they were just like, it was like, here's what I really believe. I think they were giving the questions beforehand. Because <laughs> they had these answers like so polished up. I'm thinking, like, you know, being a pastor is messy. That was my answer. It's messy. You deal with messy people all the different times. You know what I'm saying? We're like bugs. Think of a few nuts. That's the truth. I really believe that. There's some nutty people that go to the church. Amen? Amen. The ones that didn't say amen, you're the nutty ones. Right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, they're, they're doing all these big things. I mean, one of the questions was, what, what's one advice you would give to a pastor? And one of, them, one of the guys goes, preach the word. And I'm like, they're, they're, they're all pastors. They're all preaching the word. What, what kind of answer is that? They're already doing it. You're not telling that. They're already doing it. So anyway, that's, my, that's been my week. I've just, I've just been, I've pretty much had it up in here, okay? And because uh, I believe through personal study time, personal time with God, that God will give you exactly what he wants you to preach on. And for the last six years that I've been here at Trinity, he's never failed to give me a text to preach on. And so I'm tired of I'm putting everything away on, as far as structure. There's no structure to this sermon today, okay? There's no structure. I feel rebellious. I shaved my beard off yesterday. I just feel rebellious, all right? And so I got, I, I have one point. That's it. I just got one point, one truth that I want to talk about from this passage, one topic for this topical sermon. And so that truth is what it means to suffer for Christ and how if the good news is really good, then we can rely on the on God being good even through our suffering. So I'm going to trust it. That what God's in my heart today is exactly what somebody needs to hear today. And so what does it mean to actually suffer for Christ? That's, that's my point, guys. You have to understand this as Christian. As Christians, suffering for Christ is a victory for believers. Suffering for Christ is a victory for believers. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that you should seek suffering. Please pay close attention. Just as much as the prosperity gospel that if you just donate to this number on the screen, we'll send you a prayer cloth and God will, do, will give you a million dollars in your bank account tomorrow, okay, if you give us a million dollars today. Like, like, the prosperity gospel, just as much as that is a false gospel, I believe that with all my heart, okay, because I know regardless is, is, regardless if God ever gave you anything good in your life from this point forward, he is still perfect, he is still holy, and he is still good, and he is still worth Every praise. You understand that? He still, I care less how much you donate to the church. If you don't ever get another good thing, God is still good. So, so I hate the, the prosperity gospel, but poverty gospel is also a false teaching. Right? I knew a pastor who literally went on a mission trip. He came home, and he decided he was going to live in poverty. He sold his house. He sold his belongings uh, because he was going to force himself to live in suffering for Christ. Well, you know what just happened? He destroyed his family. He destroyed his marriage. He destroyed his ministry. Did that honor God? No. We shouldn't seek suffering, but if suffering comes our way by God, then we should rejoice in the suffering. Some of you guys bring suffering onto yourselves, and you've got to know this. Some of you guys are bringing suffering to yourselves through your attitude, your hatred, through your actions, through your sins that you live in, through your, through your sufferings. Like, because you have these sufferings in your life because of things you're doing, there's a consequence, right? A lot of your suffering is because of a consequence. I cannot blame God for the constant pain in my back because I know for years and years I thought I was a rock star, and so I would, we had a, I had a big old base cabinet with, you know, it was loud as it would have really would shaken this whole church if I would have brought it. You know what I'm saying? It was a big old base cabinet, and peg, uh, and I would haul it around all these big little venues. Little, they were big. They were small little places. And I had all this big thing around thinking I was awesome. Then I would jump around and I'd swing my bass around and I would think I was so cool, you know what I'm saying? I was giving myself a concussion every night, shaking, you know, head, head banging. And then, 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 stupidest thing I ever did in my life. I can't blame God for the back pain that I'm feeling in my 30s because of how I took care of my back in my 20s. I didn't. You know what I'm saying? That's not on God. That's on me. I was an idiot. I thought I was cool. Still do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but let me even put it this way, because I think this will help some of you guys even, even more. I don't consider
consider suffering for my children a burden. Now, now hear this. I don't consider suffering for my children a burden. We don't even call it a suffering. We, we call it a sacrifice sometimes. We call it family. We call it the price you pay as a parent. But I'll work 160 hours a week to provide for my children if I have to do that. You know what I'm saying? I don't consider that a burden. It, it, I would starve to death before I let my kids starve to death. You know what I'm saying? I, I shield my kids from the evils of this world. I protect my house, my family while they sleep. And so I do those things. And, and it, leaves, it leaves me tired and worried and stressed and overwhelmed. But it's also one of the greatest joys of my life. As a parent, it is not a burden to try to take care of your children. You suffer for your kids. And it's not something that you really even think about because it's just that's just what you do if you're a good parent. Now, the worst parents in the world see that responsibility as a chore and a burden and as a mistake. And if you grew up in a household like that or if you're currently in a household like that, let me be the first one to apologize. That is not a good parent. A parent should never see their children as a burden. Okay? Uh, that's not what God created us to be as parents. But unfortunately, in our self-absorbed psycho culture, we have so many parents and grandparents that care more about themselves than their kids and their grandkids, and that is a sad state of affairs. But again, as a good parent, because I love my kids, I don't see protecting them and raising them and loving them as a burden, even with all the growing pains that come from kids. You know what I'm saying? Because there are some times and seasons where they go through the terrible twos and they stay in the terrible twos until they're six. <laughs> but that's a suffering that we, that we, that we enjoy. Amen? But that's how we need to view Christianity. It's not a burden to read your Bible. It's not a burden to cut people in your, off in your life that are causing you temptation. It's not a burden to stand up for your faith, even when someone mocks you, because the world can mock Abel Crozier all at once. I know where I'm going when all is said and done. And I know what happens to the person who mocks my Lord and Savior. Does it end well for them? You get what I'm saying? So, so uh, 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 the Bible says... God's going to get his revenge. And I pray none of you guys are on the wrong side of that revenge. There's a joy in suffering for Christ. It's a glorious suffering because if somebody insults you or calls you suffering for Christ, that means you're doing something right as a Christian. Because when we suffer for Christ, our suffering is attached to Jesus' suffering that gives us meaning and purpose. But again, in verse 14, it says if it's a sinful suffering, that's different. Right? Look at it. Suffering for Christ is glorious. But he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, Okay. Some of you moms, I push come to shove. You always murder somebody for your kids. Okay. But it says don't do that. <laughs> Just the Bible. None of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. Some tra Trump translations say busybody. Did you realize? And this is important to understand. You can cut out the majority of your suffering by avoiding these things. Did y'all know that? You, you, you could cut out a lot of your suffering by taking out, and this is not an exhaustive list. Like You could add more to this list. Avoid killing people. You'll, you'll, it'll save you a lot of suffering. Okay? <laughs> save you some jail time and all that mess. So, okay? <laughs> Court problems, uh, money, financial, that, that causes a lot of people. Stealing from people, being evil, starting trouble. Did you know starting trouble causes a lot of suffering, not only for you, but for everybody around? You can cut out some suffering if you stop, stop making some trouble in every situation that we deal with, all right? A lot of the suffering we deal with is due to trying to control situations instead of just giving those situations over to God and saying, God, you're going to have to handle this because I cannot on my own. I don't have the ability or the patience or the self-control to try to handle this situation. And instead of causing more suffering for everybody in this place, I'm going to give it over to you and let you handle it. Have you ever done that? Sometimes we need to get to a place where we say, I'm just going to give it all over to God. On Friday, I went to the FBI field office in Louisville for a chaplain training. I'm telling you what, I was, I've was i never been so nervous in my entire life because uh, in one sense, I was, I was raised to respect law enforcement, okay? But we were also raised with a certain uh, fear for, for law enforcement as well. I, I, don't, I don't look like most people, in case you did not know that. And so we were taught that how we interacted with law enforcement had to be a little bit different than everybody else. You understand that? So if I get pulled over in the middle of the night, uh, by a police officer, we were taught that you better turn on all the interior light. You put your you put your hands on your steering wheel with your fingertips out, and you say yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. You do whatever they say for the moment because you can fight all that stuff, whatever issue you have, if you disagree with them, you can fight all that stuff in a safer environment later. You don't do it on the side of the road when, when everybody's tensed up and nervous. You get what I'm saying? I was taught how to do that 
in, in uh, growing up, you know. They're, they're, and it even went further than that. If I walk into a store, I don't walk around and look around. I don't, I don't have the privilege of going to there and go, I'm going to look around the store and everything's going to be wonderful. My wife will go shopping and she'll go to every store in the world and just look around and pick up, this looks nice, and, she'll, and then she'll put it back. <laughs> And then she'll keep walking. I don't have that. I don't have that freedom. I don't. If I walk into a store, I always hear them go, we need a worker on aisle four. And I'm like, I'm the only one on aisle four. I don't need a worker. I don't know why everybody, you know what I'm saying? And so I learned growing up that you, you go in and you get out. You get, if you got to get something in the store, you get in, you get out, and you pay for it. You know what I'm saying? We don't put our hands in our pocket. We were taught that. You don't go into a store with your hands in your pocket because it looks like you're stealing something. So I walk into a store. If you ever see me in a store, which you probably won't because I don't go into stores very often. Because I was raised that you got to be careful. So if I ever do walk into a store, my hands are not in my pocket, I get exactly what I want and I leave. All right? And, and here's, the, here's the thing. If I don't, <laughs> this is how bad it is because this even happened this week. On Tuesday, I was going to get a drink at, at the gas station before we headed to, to Lexington. And so I, I go to this gas station. They were out of the drink that I wanted. Now, some of you guys would just walked out and went to another one to, like, you know, to find the drink. Not me. I had to go to the candy section to get a candy so I didn't walk out of the store empty-handed. You know what I'm saying? That's how crazy it is. And so the whole time I'm thinking, I'm going to get shot at the FBI place. Just, I, you know, that's how weird it was. I, I thought maybe J. Edgar Hoover would come around the corner and scare me at some point, you know. Go get that, J. Edgar he started the, okay, history. He started the, the, okay, I'm trying to say the word FBI too often. They, they flag it, I think, like 10 times they start flagging it if you say it out in public. Okay, here's my point. I get to the FBI field office, and, and had, we had a great time. They keep you in a room, they escort you. You couldn't even go to the bathroom without like a, a secret agent coming in behind you, taking you to the bathroom, which was kind of weird. But we had a good time, we had a good time. And uh, not only was it a good time, but I actually had an agent come up to me. He like searched me out and said, are you Aiden Crozier? Which was weird because if the FBI knows your name, that's not a great thing. All right? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, uh, anyway, he wanted me to, he was wanting me to be a chaplain for the FBI. How weird is that? He already knew me, knew my background. I don't need to be a chaplain. And I said, well, what does that entail? He goes, well, there's a 20 month vetting process that we have to go through to make sure you're okay. You know what I'm saying? 20 months. And so if anybody gets interviewed by the FBI over the next two years about me, it's okay. All right? Tell them how much you love me. Don't lie or it's a federal offense, but you should tell them how much you love me. <laughs> For, for nothing, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, instead of suffering all week and not being able to enjoy all week, you know, I, I, I should have just been, God, I'm going to put all my trust in you, that you're going to take care of everything, that you actually probably were already setting all this stuff up, stuff up with the FBI in a secret. You and the FBI were probably working to get me there so that you could ask me, you know, creepy, ain't it? <laughs> They're watching everything. And now I've said the FBI works for 10 times. Now we get a phone call this afternoon saying, why were you talking about us today? And so, <laughs> here's my point. Some of you go through great suffering, and instead of living in shame about it, you got to start using it as part of your testimony to help somebody else who is going through something similar. Don't use your life situation as a crutch. Start using it as a tool. There are these twin brothers who grew up in the same household, shared the same parents, went to the same school, had the same exact upbringing, but once they grew up, one brother became a criminal. And they asked him, they said, what in the world happened? How did your life end up like this? He said, I grew up in a religious household with religious parents, conservative parents. We had all these rules and, and very little freedoms. How else would I have ended up? Well, his brother, his twin brother, was a, su a successful lawyer, had a beautiful family. They said, how did you end up like this? He said, I grew up with religious parents conservative parents. We had all these rules and a lot of barriers to keep us out of trouble. Same situation, same household, brother, two different paths. You can either use your situation or your struggle as a, as a crutch, or you can use it as a tool. That's why Peter says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, you don't have to be ashamed of any suffering that comes your way because of who you serve. Which here's a fun fact for you. Did you know the word Christian is used only three times in the New Testament? 
Right? They, they used to have names called like followers of Jesus. They used to be called uh, disciples, believers, those who belong to the way. And it wasn't a term of endearment like we use all the time. We use, we use Christian as, as like a as a get free card. Well, I'm a Christian. I, I, I can say this because I'm a Christian. I can get out of this because I'm a Christian. I don't judge because I'm a Christian. Like we use it as a term of endearment. That's not what they did. Okay? They used it when they scoffed at it. They said that's one of those, one of those people that belong to the way. I heard a pastor share this. Uh, uh, they took an elderly lady and a group of church members on a mission trip to Israel. And she was wandering around the, these areas where they had all these little shops. It was like a big marketplace. And she was just trying to find the post office to buy a stamp to send a postcard to her daughter. And she said to an uh, Arab shopkeeper, where is the post office here? And he said, you go down this alleyway, you look for an opening on the left. You go up some steps till you get to a fork. You turn right at the fork. Look for the second opening on the right. Go down that way. And the more he spoke, the more confused she looked. And, he, and she said, I'll never find the way. She said, I'll never find the way. And so he turned around, closed his little shop, padded off the shutters, took her by the elbow, and he said, well, I am the way. And he took her to the post office. And she was so excited when she came back to the rest of the group. And she said, guess what I learned this morning? She said, I always wondered what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way. She said, now I know. It means he's going to take me there. I don't need to know the route. He's going to take me there. He'll lead me there. He'll guide me to where I'm supposed to be. Now I find that interesting because I, I talk to so many people who are trying to get to someplace greater in their life. They want some peace. They want some hope. They want a future. They go, I'm trying to get my life right. I'm trying to get this right. I'm trying to clean this up. I'm trying to get to a better place. Well, guess what? You don't have to try because we serve the way, the truth, and the life. And if you just hold on to him, he'll carry you exactly where you got to go, isn't it? Yeah. Same way that God loved the Israelites, our Savior leads us. Right? Because we want to get to that promise land. And we want to, we want to find uh, ourselves <laughs> in a better place. It's just, we do this all the time. The Israelites didn't get to the promise land on their own. Did you know that? It took them 40 years. But guess who they followed every time they had to move? It was God. They followed the presence of God. That's how they get to the promise land. That's the same for us, guys. The, our Savior leads God and directs us. He is the way, the truth, and life. And you don't have to figure it out. You just got to surrender your life to him and let him take control. Just like, just like, just like uh, he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they walked in that fiery furnace, he was there with them in the midst of the fire. God will be with you through your struggle, through your hurt, through your pain. But you cannot get to, to our Heavenly Father, guess what? Except through Jesus Christ the way. Let me wrap this up. Look, look at verse 17 through 19. This is beautiful, guys. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household, the hold of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's, if it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Peter, at the beginning of this passage, is saying, look, be courageous in your suffering. Take joy in your suffering. Don't be ashamed, but glorify God in your suffering. And then Peter drops another bomb on us. Judgment begins at the house of God. God will allow suffering among believers. Why? To purify us. If your prayer life is lacking, I promise you, God will give you a reason to pray. If you think every good thing that's happening in your life is called by you, God will give you a reminder that nothing in this life is happening by you. Some of you suffer financially because you still think your finances are in your control. It's done by your hands and your ability, and it's your money to begin with. God is going to remind you, I promise you, that, that, that uh, it is by his hands that you even have the ability to get up. Right? It's, it's by his hands that you even have the ability to get a job and have a job and have a, a way to get to that job and to make that money in the first place. You understand that? God will remind you of that every single day. I always say this, uh, but, but God will allow you to hit rock bottom so that you will finally look up and say, okay, God, I can't do it on my own. That's right. do, do you think that what's happening to our nation right now is coincidence? No, God is trying to wake us up to our dependence on Him. And I'm going to tell you this. Y'all need to hear this super quickly. Don't miss this. If He needs to put a president in office that will destroy our nation to wake us up, He will do it. If He needs to put a president in office that will destroy this nation to wake us up, He will do it. If we think Kamala Harris or Donald Trump is going to save us, uh, and be our saving grace. 
God is saying, fine, you can have it. Good luck with them. Are you understanding? We gotta stop relying on these, these idiotic presidential candidates and putting our faith and our trust in them. You understand that? Because I promise you God's gonna say, if you think Donald Trump is gonna save it, if you think Kamala Harris is gonna save it, I will put them in office and then I'm gonna say, good luck. I, we gotta be careful of this. We gotta pay attention to this. Right? I don't want any, either one of them to control my life. I want my life to be in God's hand and God's hand only. I want this nation to be in God's hand and God's hand only. And we go, why do we suffer? Uh, well, but, but, but unbelievers can do whatever they want and they can enjoy life and they don't have to suffer like we suffer, you know? Well, Peter says the suffering we endure as Christians is to purify us, but the suffering of the unbeliever is going to come later and that suffering is going to come for eternity. So endure the suffering we have now, the temporary, for our good. But understand that God's going to allow us to open up a door for us, to, uh, allow us to suffer, to open up a door for us to walk through to give us a, an opportunity to be a witness. I told this story a few years ago, but I think it's so prevalent to our life today. 1992, a grand dragon in the Ku Klux Klan, KKK, made the front page news. His name was Larry Trapp. Y'all can look this up if you ever get a chance. Larry Trapp was a miserable man who hated anyone that didn't look like him, believe what he believed, talk the way that he talked. And one of the problems that he had was his neighbor was a Jewish leader in the community named Michael Weiser. And he hated him just because he was a Jew. And so Larry would make death threats against Michael. He would taunt him. He would put these uh, uh, anti-Jew flags up in his front yard. He would go and protest in front of the synagogue that Michael went to. But one day, out of the blue, Larry tore down his Nazi flags, destroyed all the hate literature, and he denounced the KKK. You want to know why? Because one day Larry finds out that he was dying from a diabetes-related kidney disease, and he found himself unable to care for himself. And he was such a mean and ugly person that nobody was willing to have anything to do with him except one person, Michael Weiss. Michael found out that he was dying, and so he went and began to care for Larry. He began to fix him his meals. He took him to the doctors. He became an advocate for Larry. And, 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 and at one point, he even took him to his own house to help care for him. And Larry said, he showed me so much love that I could not help but love him back. Amen. He showed me so much love that I could not help but love him back. Our culture wants us distracted. Our culture wants us divided. Our culture wants us at war. But we cannot be distracted by what the world is doing. We cannot get caught up in the name callings and the, and the mockery. Because here's, the, here's what I know. I know there are some people that come to our church that go to a different service than somebody else because they don't like that person because they said something to them. There are people that don't come to our church because somebody said something to them. We, we have people that, that will literally sit on the opposite side of the church because they go, I can't sit near that person because they said something to me. Why don't you be like, like the Jewish uh, community leader, Michael, and say, regardless of how you feel about me, I'm still going to love you. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. We, we understand why we get to love people because we have Jesus Christ that loves us. We cannot be so distracted, especially at the church, with running church, conducting business, that we forget the basics of Christianity, which is to love others. As we begin this time of invitation, guys, I want you to think about your suffering that you're going through in your life. Are you suffering because of your sinful life, or are you suffering for Christ? Are you suffering because of the situation that you put yourself in, or are you suffering for Christ? If you're suffering for your sins, guess what the best way to, to get out of that suffering? is to get to an old-fashioned altar and repent of those sins. If you're suffering for some sin that you're, you got in your life, the best way to get rid of that suffering is to get to an altar and repent of the sin that caused that suffering. If you're suffering because Christ is trying to purify you or walk you through a season, then guess what you should do also? You should get to the altar and praise God and rejoice in the glory of God for taking you through a hard season so that you can come out stronger on the other end or so that you can have a testimony to give somebody that's going to go through the same thing you're going to go through. We got to recognize this. So with every head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here and you don't know Christ your Lord and Savior, and if today you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart this morning, all you have to do is ask Christ to come into your heart, and I can tell you this, He will never tell you no. God would never turn someone away who was seeking Him. Ask Christ to come to your heart. Because here's the thing. He already said yes.
on the cross when he died for your sins. He already said yes. All he's asking us is to receive that free gift of salvation. So as it comes time of invitation, finally at the altar, we'll walk you through the plan of salvation. For everybody else, the altar is going to be open to you to give your sufferings and anything else over to God. Let us pray. Very gracious Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place. Thank you, God, for allowing him to be raised again for our new life. Thank you for your spirit that draws people into the kingdom to know you and make you known. I pray, God, that if there is a lost person that's here today, if there's somebody that's going through a suffering in their life, God, I pray they start seeing it in a different perspective. I pray they get to this altar and, and, and ask for some forgiveness, God. I pray they repent of that sin that's causing the suffering or recognize that purification is happening through that suffering. And I pray, God, God, that your people begin to move even as I prepare to say amen this morning to come to this old-fashioned altar. So Jesus Christ, my name, I pray, and all God's people say amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing.